Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time Worlds, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. Today, we're going to talk about character arcs. So building on the previous episode where we talked about developing the character up to the point where you're telling the story, we're now going to talk about the arc that you take your character through from the point where you turn the camera on to the point where you turn the camera off. If this kind of content interests you, if you like talking about this kind of stuff, hit the subscribe button down below or Add us as a favorite on your podcasts, hit the like button, share the episodes, and help us grow our audience. Okay, let's get cracking on character arcs. So, Drake, do you want to start us with some initial thoughts? I mean, this is is a big topic, and this is an all-encompassing topic, and we're going to talk about some specifics. The main thing that we're, we're really hitting here is why this is so important to the success of the story. Um, Because we are going to be talking about stories that really, really work and then stories that really, really don't work and kind of why. Um, But like I said in the last one, a lot of this has to do with the theme. We we discussed how you you don't know where your character starts until you know what the theme is because they have to start on the wrong side. You don't know what the inciting incident is going to be until you know what the theme is because the 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 characters being on the wrong side of the theme is what causes the inciting incident. You don't know what act two is going to be the road of trials and all those, uh, you know, moments where he's either succeeding or failing, but he's growing as a character because that's him going against the theme. You know, every scene needs to either have the theme beat him and say, Hey dude, you're on the wrong side of the theme or have him beat the theme and say, ha I'm not on the wrong side of the theme. I can do it my way. And as he waffles through that and, and learns and grows and, and all that. You don't know what the false overcome is going to be, the all hope is lost moment, uh, another way to say that, without him knowing what the theme is, so he tries to stay on the wrong side of the theme and comes up with a plan to accomplish that. I didn't say this in the last podcast, but like as the example, Luke Skywalker is going to use technology to blow up the Death Star. He's got his X-Wing, he's got his robot, you know, his little droid, he's got the rest of the Rebel fleet, he's going to use that. And it fails miserably. And so he has to realize that he has to give up and he has to believe in something greater than himself in faith to accomplish the mission. And then, you know, the overcome is that transformation and that is how the audience consumes it. So, so in one aspect, in the, in the mundane humdrum aspect, that is your character arc, but that isn't good enough. Like that is the bare bones you know, structure that we're going to lay this character on. So what we're really going to be focusing on today is more about taking that to 11, you know, really making these, you know, sure, we can follow that structure and we can go, oh, I know what the theme is. And oh, so they have to start here. And oh, so they have to be here. And oh, but that is not going to make a, a story that makes people want to remember these characters and want to talk about them and want to recommend it to their friends. And so a lot of the examples that you've pulled out, Marie, are are that they're they're those characters that that are so dynamic and their their growth is so amazing that not only is it totally relatable but it makes you really be able to put yourself in their position and go wow would i actually do that you know what would i be like in this situation which is what makes stories stay with us so let's start with i guess our first example and one that we've been meaning to talk about for a while on this podcast. And that is Captain America and Iron Man and their two growth cycles in comparison to each other. I think one of the funniest things when I talk to people about this, a lot of people don't even realize how integral each one of those characters is to the other because you have Captain America movies, you have Iron Man movies, sure, they're in the Avengers, sure, there was Civil War, but for the most part, a lot of people see them as completely islands, you know, separate. They, they don't have anything to do with each other. But the reality is the, the brilliance of phase one and phase two of, you know, the Marvel movie franchise was those two pillars. Like everything else in my mind is ancillary. 
those two are the story. They are the reason for the amazingness of those two stories. I tend to agree with you because their character arcs are the reverse of each other. And can't happen without the other. Yes. They grow from each other, which is amazing. Like their relationship is what forces both of them to grow. And that is because of their starting point. So if you look at the starting points of these two characters, on the one hand, you have Steve Rogers, who is the probably the most selfless of the superhero set. Of humanity. <laughs> of humanity. He is the dude who will throw himself on top of the grenade. You know, he, he will do anything. Keep getting up when the bully is beating him down because he knows that the bully's wrong. Even though he knows he can't beat the bully. Like that scene in the alleyway, everything that they did, all these little scenes that they did was to really show you, you know, those are the two I think that are the most impactful. Him getting up and continuing to take that ass whipping from the guy that he cannot stand up to and then throwing himself on the grenade in training. And, and then at the end of his introductory movie, of course, you know, he pilots a plane and it ends up in the ice and he gives up basically everything. Yeah. Doesn't realize he can survive that. Yeah. So he's completely selfless. And then on the other side, you have Tony Stark, whose <laughs> origin film is very, very, very different. I mean, he is a narcissist, playboy, weapons manufacturer. And even at the end where he's like, okay, I'm going to stop manufacturing weapons. It's not like he stops manufacturing weapons really out of, you know, the depths of his heart and really gives up. It's more that he feels bad about it because he was caught in the middle of the conflict and that's why he gives up manufacturing weapons. Like, it is a very small step. You're, you're 100% right. It's still a very selfish, narcissistic step. It's a, I'm going to stop doing this because it makes me feel bad. He doesn't do it because of the, the atrocities that it brings and the death and the misery and, and all the horrible stuff that it brings to the world. He does it for himself. It makes him feel better. He's almost virtue signaling in doing it. Uh, obviously, he's doing it, so he's not just virtue signaling. And, and look at the way that he, you know, he gets onto the stage and he's like, we're going to stop manufacturing weapons. I mean, it's absolutely still all about it's, him. Look at me, pat me on the back because I'm doing this amazing thing because I am awesome. Yes. And like Steve Rogers was going to, at the end of that movie where he, he dumps the plane in the ocean, he's not even going to tell anybody. They, they, they start figuring, they have to figure out he's going to kill himself. And that's when Carter gets on the line and, and they have that beautiful conversation between them. But he wasn't even going to take, he wasn't even going to say, hey, guys, I need you to pat me on the back before I do this because I'm about to kill myself to save the world. Yeah. He doesn't do that. He literally makes the decision and then is going to take it to his grave by himself as his own personal little sacrifice. Whereas, you know, again, they have yeah. to, they have to kind of guess and figure out what he's doing. Yeah. And so that selflessness, and there's been lots of characters like that, but 100%. that selflessness, that amazing, because I think that's something that most of, of us, I, I, I think most of us can absolutely go, oh yeah, if I was a playboy phil philanthropist billionaire, I would be exactly Tony Stark. You know, give me the fame, give me the fortune, give me the money, give me the cars, give me the women, give me the, 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 the accolades. I think all of us can do that. I think all of us really hardcore struggle with the, the Steve Rogers arc where it's like, would I literally give up everything for everyone else without any other reason than I, then it's the right thing to do. Uh, many of us aspire to it. I, I, oh, certainly. I doubt that many of us, I, I don't know. Like for myself, I don't know. But regardless, so you have these two very different characters. And as, as I said, the interesting thing about Tony Stark's journey, because Tony Stark does go on a journey where in the final movie, he does do the completely selfless thing. And the thing is, when he does that in that final movie, he has a lot to lose. You know, he's gone from having very little to lose to having everything to lose. And I will, I, I will challenge, because I think you're talking about the fact that he has a wife and a kid. And yeah. 
and a life that, that away from the public. And, and he's really devoted himself to his child and, and he's become this amazing father. And, but I think not only is, is, is the Steve Rogers example, an amazing thing for him to have watched and to have, have consumed. But I think those are other uh, bricks in that wall. Those are other elements that without those, I don't know if, I don't know if Steve Rogers was enough to make him sacrifice himself. I, I agree. Those, those things obviously do contribute because, you know, he's also saving the world for his children. And so right. he makes the absolutely selfless decision and yes, there is still that moment where he's like, I am Iron Man, but he doesn't expect accolades. He doesn't go looking for, you know, a, a well, it's, just... he knows that this is it, that this is the last thing he's going to ever do. So he's got to say his character has to do the smart ass comment because it isn't it isn't his character if he doesn't do it. So he's compelled. I mean, I would feel like if I was that character and I know that I'm about to push a button and kill myself. I'm going to have to leave the world with one last, you know, Drake smart ass comment before I go. And and that's it exactly. That's why that arc is so satisfying because you went from the the start of it in Iron Man 1 where he really is not that likable a character. Mm -hmm. Like it was an enjoyable movie, but Tony Stark was not a likable character. Mm -hmm. And the steps that he made was so incrementally small you know that step-by-step -step process of him coming to the point where he's ready to sacrifice himself it was such a long process that when it happens you really genuinely feel that it is so earned you feel that the character growth you have sweated on every step of the character growth and you have watched him grow in that direction while Steve Rogers has slowly been growing in the other direction of realizing that sometimes you are allowed to carve out some time for yourself. You are allowed to take pleasure for yourself. It is not always about everyone else. Yep. You got to look after yourself at some point or it just becomes not mm -hmm. worth living. Exactly. You know, you look at him at the end of his, you know, mm. story arc, and he's also completely opposite. He is selfish. He is, it's all about me. I'm going to do this because I want to do it. And it's, it only affects me and, you know, Carter, obviously, but I'm going to do this because I want to do this. This yeah. is for me. But again, at the end of that one, I think the audience is like, but you've earned it. Yes. Like you have already killed yourself for everyone else. What, three times? So Dude, take take a vacation, man. You you've absolutely earned it. Mm. And I think that they did a really smart thing with the fact that he did actually save the world before he went back into his own little pocket reality to have his life. So he already knew that even though he's back in time and he's watching all this stuff because you know, the the crazy thing to think about and and I went down this path. I'm now Captain America living while the other Captain America and the world is going through these hardships. And I have all this knowledge that could absolutely help them out. But since I know it already turns out correct, like that's also a sacrifice to not get involved, mm -hmm. to, to literally become a ghost, uh, even though it's selfish because he's doing it for his life. In another way, he's still sacrificing because that's got, that had to have been, that had to have been 50 years of pain for him. He could have made it better. Sure, he might have screwed it up too, which is what he was afraid of. But the reality is, is more than likely with all his foreknowledge, he actually would have made things better if he had gotten re-involved as an older Captain America with all this knowledge. So in a way, that's also a sacrifice for him because that had to be just crushing to his soul, you know, to have to struggle with that. That And of course, they don't go into this in a movie, yeah. but... This is me extrapolating because that's that's what I do. I, I would have to say that that's also, you know, well in line with the Stephen Rogers desire and, and, and character. And what I really enjoyed about his decision to carve out some time for himself is 
not only had he saved the world, but he'd also kept his promise to the, what was her name? The grand master, high grand time master, Puba, mm, yeah. with a shaved head. I can't remember her name for love or money right now. No. He kept his promise to her and returned the infinity stones to the correct places using the, like he'd done everything. So he, when he, when he then does that and he stays with Peggy, like, Literally every I is dotted, every T is crossed, and and he can move forward and be with his love for one lifetime. And that makes it a beautiful end to his arc. And while Tony Stark's death, I mean, I cried like a little baby girl at Tony Stark's funeral. <laughs> I cried like it was a real person. And that's how you know that they wrote him well. Yeah. It was very satisfying. Like his arc was very satisfying and remains very satisfying. And even though it was sad to me that the character died, it left me fulfilled. Sad, but fulfilled. Not to shift gears completely because we can still stay on this. But Romanoff, her story arc is much the same. You know, she had a very clear purpose from the very beginning. I've got a lot of red on my ledger. I need to get into the black. And so when she sacrifices herself, you know, it's her and Hawkeye and they're on the cliff and, and she's like, I'm sorry, like, this is going to be me and it isn't going to be you. It's never going to be you. You, you understand, even though that was horribly sad, you understood that that was her finishing her mission. Now, now her arc is different because from the very beginning, like when, once, when you meet her, she's already left the bad guys and moved to the good guys and already on this redemption arc where she's trying to redeem herself and, and redeem her soul from the evil that she did up to that point. So it's not like Stony Stark where he starts off really horrible and then, you know, eventually moves to it, but it is kind of the same trajectory where I have done a bunch of horrible things and I'm going to make up for it. The difference is, is I don't think Tony Stark understood until that very last moment until that last battle when he actually took the glove i think that's when he went wow this is how i make amends for all the crap that i did that i didn't even realize that i was doing mm -hmm. whereas romanov is like i'm going to make amends for everything that i've done from start to finish which which is why even though the story arcs are so similar they're so different they're worlds yeah. apart and you have a different feeling um, it's why Romanov's death is not as sad because you're actually proud that she has done what she did because she really did accomplish her, you know, clear goal, which is what we talked about in the last thing, understanding your character's very clear goal. Whereas Tony Stark, I don't think ever really understood until that moment. And you kind of see it in his face where he's like, shit, <laughs> like, I didn't realize this is where I was going, but you know what? Now that I'm here, I guess I was going here all along, whereas she's like, dude, this is where I've been. I've been heading to this cliff. This is my goal. This is where I'm at. You are not taking this from me, you know, period. And what made that, what also made Romanov's uh, story so satisfying, she and Hawkeye had become such friends. And you could see that developing as well. And I think that's one of the things that the, the, Phase one MCU really got right. They built relationships between the characters. Characters that worked together, like Hawkeye and Natasha, you know, because they they worked because of they were both the humans, right? They didn't have any superpowers. They were just basic humans with really good combat skills. Uh, they worked in terms of their friendship. And then when they found the item and their fight over who's going to sacrifice each other, it was very human. You know, it's it's beyond the powers and it's just basically about the humanity. Wanda and, and Vision really worked because they were both such complete outsiders. Mm -hmm. you know, Vision's a machine and Wanda is, I mean, <laughs> yeah. She was very broken. And she's trying to pick up the pieces and vision. Vision wasn't broken. He was more blank. Yeah. So vision's trying to learn what humanity is. And 
Wanda is trying to rebuild her humanity, yes. which is what makes them such a great pairing to be able to go through that. And I think it's the reason why they were attracted to each other, that that they had this commonality that formed their their romantic relationship to be built off of. Yes. That's also why Captain America and Iron Man really worked, because they were so different. Which is why even even to the bitter end, they fought with each other constantly. I mean, that was they, they never had anything but an antagonistic relationship. But to me, one of the big things about the those characters that we've mentioned, all of those characters we've brought up so far, is that their growth feels earned. You, we spoke about Tony's first step, which was still a narcissistic step. It's still a step that's all about him. And sometimes he backslid into pure narcissism. And Steve Rogers' slow growth of like independence and doing things for himself sometimes backslid into, no, it's all about other people. That kind of forward and backward and forward and backward and the character, like growth isn't a thing that just overnight, you know, you change. And I do want to, I do want to piggyback onto that just to expand upon it because it still comes down to like Tony Stark's backsliding and then what brings him back every time is pepper Potts, mm. his relationship with her and the fact that you know even though he can have anything he wants he learns that that's all he needs that's that's really what tony stark needs to be a complete human being and so and i don't think he realizes it consciously but him pursuing her even when she was just like dude you're just some rich asshole that i work for i have no freaking interest in you like, even then, when he is still courting her, I think he thinks he's doing it because he's just being cute and, you know, free-spirited and all that. But I think deep down, even then, his soul knows this is the thing that's going to save me. This woman here is the only redemption I will ever have. And so you watch him as he goes through his, his stories, and every time he falls into himself and he falls away from his path, it's the fact that she is there in his life and he realizes how he's treating her and how she's affected by what he's doing that brings him back to the path that's going to take him to saving the entire cosmos. Absolutely. Those relationships that they built and, the, and that process of growth through the relationships is what makes the character's growth feel so earned it makes you feel at the end of it it makes you feel fulfilled even when the character dies it makes you feel fulfilled and i'd be remiss if i didn't if i didn't prove your statement true with the steve rogers arc so with 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 tony stark it's pretty obvious the whole pepper pox relationship and through every single movie and and how she impacted him and how much he started realizing, and then obviously with the marriage and the kid and, and all that. However, it is also proven true on the Steve Rogers side in the fact that they both absolutely always wanted a relationship and it was never allowed to them. They never were able to hold hands. They never were able to kiss. They never were able to do anything, even though both of them knew that they absolutely wanted a loving relationship with them. And so it's the reason why you feel that he earned going back in time and spending 50 years with the woman of his love, you know, the, the woman he loved more than anything else, because he spent 50 years lifetime or even more not getting her. I mean, that scene where they thaw him out and he's like, you know, where is Carter? And it's like, well, I mean, she's 97 years old. And so even that scene, it's so breathtakingly moving of how much he loves her as this man in the prime of his life and this 97-year-old woman. And another great story that they did that with, Robert Sawyer's Rollback. It's, it's one of the best science fiction books I've ever read. And I don't read a lot of science fiction. I'm definitely more fantasy. But basically, they end up in that. They were, they were high school sweethearts. They have the exact same birthday. When you meet them, they're both in, in their late 80s, early 90s. They've been married 
you know, since they got out of high school and then something happens and he ends up being 21 again, but he's married to this 80 some year old woman that he still absolutely loves as much as he did, you know, his entire life. And so having to deal with that, having to deal with her death, you know, having to deal with the fact that he still needs to move on. He's still a young man now. So you can't just go through life as a widow starting at 21 and never experience love again. Humans aren't designed for that. And so, you know, they did a great job with that. But again, it's about earning. And I, and I think this is another thing that a lot of writers struggle with. They, they fall into the trap of maybe not fantasy fulfilling to the level that I talked about in the last podcast, which really irks me. But they still like their characters too much and don't want to punch them in the face as much as they should. Sometimes it's not even about punching them in the face as much as they should. Sometimes it's just too too fast that they learn. So sometimes I read a book and I agree. The, the characters is on the wrong side of the theme and they go through character growth and then they win. From that point forward, they win. And I'm like, yeah, but no. Right. Because just because, let's take an example. Let's say somebody is a racist. And let's say somebody's a racist scumbag. Well, she's Herman Melville from uh, from As Good As It Gets. And and they something happens to them and they start thinking, am, am I like that? Am I a racist scumbag? And they, you know, they they don't instantaneously stop being a racist scumbag it's a process they're gonna backslide you know they're gonna like be all like it's fine it's fine it's fine and then they're gonna come out with an opinion that you're just sitting there going like oh my god you're still a racist scumbag Mm -hmm. you're just less of a racist scumbag (laughs) you know and and it's a growth process that's what made as good as it gets such a brilliant movie because when you meet jack nicholson's character at the beginning of that it is not anyone you want to spend time with at all. He's a horrible, horrible, racist, bigot, horrible human being, misogynistic. I still remember that line that he says, like, how do you write such brilliant female characters? He's like, yep, I yep. remove all logic from a man. I'm like. The, the exact line is, I start with a man and then I remove all reason and accountability. Yeah. I was just like, wow. Yep. <laughs> but at the end of it, He's not there yet. Yeah. But at the end of that movie, you're like, you know what? I might hang out. I can see your trajectory now. Mm. I might actually, you might be somebody that I would hang out with. He's still not, he doesn't, he doesn't even finish the transformation at the end of that movie, but he is so far along the path Mm. and he's learned so much and he's become friends with everything that he hated. You know, his gay neighbor across the street, the, his, the black agent of that neighbor, the the dog that he freaking hated, that he's he's actually grown so much. He's still not a great human being at the end of the movie. So, you know, he's still got a long ways to go, but he is he's he's definitely on the right path. And, you know, he's on the right path and you know that from here on out, he's going to continue to try to improve because his eyes are open. And that's really the thing that needs to happen. That to me was one of the defining things of that movie is his struggle to grow and it wasn't just like one incident and suddenly everything changes it's a step-by-step process backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards it's the same with the other one and I must say that I actually hate Mel Gibson's movies generally speaking because to say that Mel Gibson and I have got different worldviews is is putting it very mildly (laughs) The the movie, the, the one that you like, What Women what, Want. What Women Want. I knew that's where you were going. Yeah. That, again, has such a good character growth arc because mm-hmm. he, he struggles, you know, and it's a rom-com, and yet mm-hmm. the growth still feels earned. And if I think of, like, a, a more modern movie that also had a good character growth arc was Fury Road, uh, Mad Max, Mad Max mm-hmm. Fury Road. Um, Charlize Theron's character in that grows from like wanting to run away from her problems to going back to face them 
And that growth also feels so earned, you know, at the end of it, because she's got all these women and she's got this dude that she's rescued off the front of the truck and they're all going to go to this utopia place and it's not there and there's only one way forward and that's back. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that forcing her to go back, that it was just such a growth moment mm-hmm. for me. I also think it's why the, the Neo character in the first Matrix movie, which they never should have made it. I should never say the first Matrix movie. I should just say the Matrix movie. The Matrix they movie. They should never have made anything after it. <laughs> but it's why, you know, he worked as well, too, because he fought that. Like, there's no way. I And we all feel that way. There's no way I'm special. There's mm-hmm. no way. You know, it, it's just it can't be. And mm-hmm. so watching him struggle with that, you feel that he earned it. Now, I'm not saying that his his arc was as massive as these others that we've been talking about it definitely wasn't it's not that type of movie it's a different type of movie but it's still earned because it goes forward and back he loses he wins he loses he wins and that's the important part is you you can't just have one character growth moment and ta-da, the character's growing it, it's got to be a forward and back and sometimes the character has to backslide and slip backwards and so on i want to talk about a couple examples that failed miserably yeah at yeah. this <laughs> i think these are easy targets this is low-hanging fruit but you know this podcast is not supposed <laughs> to be deep intellectually <laughs> um it's it's supposed to just talk about things that you can think about to become a better writer yeah. both superheroes but captain marvel is one of the worst marvel movies it has the problems that we talked about a couple podcasts ago where, you know, my problems with how they write strong women, which aren't really strong women. They're just the worst aspects of men shoved into a woman body. Um, that's not a strong woman. That's not a good character. That's not anything that you should be writing. But for whatever reason, over and over and over and over and over again, that's what they write. So that's exactly the way they wrote that character. So that's already starting off bad. But let's go back to my six questions. Sure. What's her internal conflict? She doesn't have any. Right. She kind of they kind of play with one with the, oh, I have amnesia and I don't know who I am, but they do such a horrible job at it and it never impacts her. And it never it's not like what's a good example of of having no memory. The one I think it was Ed Norton where he writes all over himself, um, Memento, where he has no memory like that. It, everything is about that. Everything is about him. Um, the number 23 with Jim Carrey. Oh, my God. You want to see how great of an actor Jim Carrey actually is? Watch the number 23. Not a comedy at all. But he doesn't remember this stuff. He doesn't. Now, the difference between those two is Jim Carrey doesn't know he doesn't remember. Whereas, you know, in Memento, he's writing all over himself. Hey, you got to remember this crap that you don't remember. What's there's a Disney movie where. I can't remember. I'm not pulling up which one it is. But anyway, there's there's one of those where it's her internal conflict and she's driven by it. Mm. So with this one, they're like, oh, yeah, she has amnesia. And yeah, she would like to know her past. But that's it. That's yeah. all they do. So there really is no internal conflict. What does she want? What does the protagonist want? That's the next question. What does Captain Marvel want? I guess she wants to kill scrolls. Sort of. What is she afraid of? What's her clear goal? What does she want to accomplish once she is pulled into the story? Why does it matter to her? And what's her fatal flaw? She doesn't have one. No. Like, so if we just look at the last podcast on these six vitally important questions, you can tie that in to go, oh, crap. If they had just answered those six questions and incorporated that into the story, oh, my goodness, how much better would that could have been? Like, this is, that's proof positive of what I preach. It's the reason why I preach this stuff, because this isn't rocket science. This is just science. It's the science of human emotion. That's what it is. And so to hit those things, you have to do the work. You have to do the, 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 the it, you know, even if you're a pantser through the story, you still have to figure some of this stuff out. Yeah. Uh, even if you figure out, you know, that's the, the problem with being a pantser to me is you write an entire story, you figure all this stuff out through writing a story, then you have to go back and either cut a bunch of chapters, rewrite a bunch of chapters, whatever. I don't want to do that. I want to figure everything out ahead of time and write it once and then just edit it to perfection. I don't want to have to rewrite and throw away chapters. And because I've already said the, the one part of my job that I hate is writing the first draft. I hate it. 
I love everything else. If I can get past that, everything else is smooth sailing for me. I can edit a, a, the same chapter 20 times and be, you know, happy as a pig in mud. I don't, it's like, yes, this is awesome. But like, look at just those six questions we talked about in the last podcast and applying them to Captain Marvel and realizing that nothing was done for her. We can, we can do that same thing with uh, Ratcatcher 2 in The Suicide Squad, which was the only DC movie that was good start to finish, but it still had that one really horrible character, which is Ratcatcher 2. What's her internal conflict? Kind of maybe her relationship with her dad and no, maybe, but they don't really, you know, what does she want? Um, maybe to be accepted, but she doesn't really, like, what's she afraid of? Eh. What's her clear goal? I have no freaking clue. You know, why does it matter? Well, I don't know what she wants. So I definitely don't have any. And, and then what's her fatal flaw? Well, she doesn't have one. So it's a crappy character start to finish that literally has no impact on the story. Now, if we apply those same six questions to Idris Alba's character, you know what his internal conflict is. He doesn't like the fact that he has been a villain and he loves his daughter and wants to keep her out of that. Yeah. You know, his daughter is the number one concern, even though he's in prison, he, that's all he cares about. And the world is going to take that from him. What does he want? He wants to protect his daughter. He doesn't care about saving the world. He wants to protect his daughter. He's going to do this mission for you. Now, later he learns it's the right thing to do, which is why he's like, you can blow my head off. I'm still going to walk that way because I'm going to fight this thing. When she's like, no, no, you're not. You're leaving now. He's now grown as a character. And now he's willing to be a hero. What is he afraid of? Well, he's afraid of rats, which is hilarious since he's par partnered up with Rat Catcher too. Uh, what's his clear goal? In the beginning, it's to save his daughter. In the, the ending, it's to save his soul by being a hero, by saving everyone else. Why does it matter to him? Well, he loves his daughter more than anything else. And really, once he learns that he needs to save his soul, it really kind of also is for his daughter. So his daughter has something better than just a criminal to look up to. What is his fatal flaw? He's a criminal. Also, you know, he's selfish. He is only doing this stuff for himself. How does he overcome that? He realizes that it's not good enough. He has to do more and get over that. So like, and, and it's an amazing character. So like, like, look at these simple six questions and how much of a difference it makes in the same movie with two, you know, you have your two protagonist characters. So, which was the theoretically written by the same writer who somehow did it great for the one character and really. <laughs> so in James Gunn's, in James Gunn's defense, mm. and I don't know, I have no inside information, mm. but I'm not 100% sure he had any choices. Because again, Ratcatcher Rat 2 is more of an agenda trying to make a story. Whereas everything else, James Gunn had, you know, the ability to do. And, and I don't know. You could be right. James Gunn could have just, just totally missed the mark on that one. We all make mistakes. But James Gunn is such a great character. Because he didn't do that in Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm. You know, he didn't have those problems. None of his female characters are the worst part of men shoved in a woman's body. Not a single one of them. And so he may not have had as much leeway with that character as maybe he sh they should have given him. Don't know. He could have also just made a mistake. Is, and, and actually, I want to go back to Captain Marvel because I had half a thought around that. The other thing about Captain Marvel is that whole process of growth, she has very few relationships and very few that matter at any meaningful level because there is a relationship with Jude Law but he's the bad guy mm -hmm. he's keeping her back there's also a relationship with that chick inside the machine again the bad guy and and her best friend back on earth I mean she has trouble connecting with her because that was pre-accident and she has very little memories of her and it's just it's she has not enough connections to grow with. And there was, the opportunities were there. Yeah. Her relationship with her friend's daughter could have been, you know, amazingly impactful on that story. Mm -hmm. Her relationship with her best friend, amazingly impactful on that story. Her, her relationship with the woman who invented the technology and sacrificed herself for it could have been amazingly impactful. Technically, they could have done a hell of a lot better with her and Sam Jackson. Even her relationship with Jude Law could have been fundamentally impactful if she had 
if they had established him as a better mentor figure at the beginning, which I think this is what they were going with. They just did such a bad job of it. If they established him better at the beginning as a mentor figure, but as a real mentor figure, like he really Mm -hmm. was training her to be one way. And And then at the end, her fight with him could have been her overcome of his conditioning her into this behavior which didn't suit her. But he, but he would have been a sympathetic villain at that point. He believes in his cause. He believes that the cr- Krill are the enemy. He believes that her power is going to help them win the war and save his people and save, like, if they had given him a family that he was fighting to protect, if they had mm. made him an actual strong male role model, if they had actually done that, not only would he have been a sympathetic character, even though technically he's on the wrong side, but during the overcome, she would have to overcome the fact that technically he is on the right side if you look at it from a different perspective. And that's a really hard thing to overcome other than just... Like, See, that would, have, that would have made it a great thematic experience as well, that overcome of like, Yes, he thinks he's on the right side of the theme. Yes, I have sympathy for him. But he is still on the wrong side. And he still needs to be stopped. And coming to that realization could have been a fundamentally impactful thing for the character. Especially if Captain Marvel had relations with his wife and children. Especially if, you know, she truly loved him Mm. on a very personal level uh, as a dear mentor that, that... was everything to her absolutely that would have been a different story again it's about those six questions developing the backstory not letting the agenda run the story but letting the story because you still have the same it's still about a woman becoming strong on her own i'm still going to accomplish the same thing you're trying to accomplish the difference is is i'm going to do a story first and then have the female empowerment as an agenda within that story as opposed to just starting with that and then trying to shove it shove a story into it i guess those that's character arcs is the do you have final closing thoughts of character arc i do because here's the thing everything that we've really discussed here has nothing to do with the structure of the story it has nothing to do with the thematic element of the story especially when we're talking about like the captain uh, captain america and tony stark uh things because that's over a saga So each one of those movies had their own thematic elements and their own things that they had to get through. But this was a much larger story arc that doesn't really have its attachment to a skeleton of structure of the story. But even when you're only doing one, like we look at as good as it gets or the matrix, we're we're gonna do one story and we're gonna have to still have this beautiful growth arc of the character. So again, storytelling is hard. It's not easy. And it irks me when people are like, oh, no, it's easy. I write, you know, 3000 books a year. Like, okay, great. But you've got one star in everything you do. So, you know, whatever. Uh, And not that there aren't people out there. I mean, Nora Roberts writes 3000 books a year and she's running five stars on everything. But she's got her own ways of shortcutting things, which we can go into at a later time. She writes for a very specific genre as well. She writes for a very specific genre and she writes the exact same story every single, she doesn't change anything but the window dressing. Yeah. Uh, so it becomes very easy to write those really, really fast. And, and that, that's not me criticizing. That is a brilliant, if I could do that, I would absolutely, absolutely do that. Uh, I, I have a great deal of respect for her ability yeah. to write the same story and yet keep it fresh enough that her readership still consumes every single one of them. John Grisham was the same way. If you read one John Grisham book, you've read them all. Absolutely. So the, the, the thing that I struggle with, with all this knowledge that I have on what has to really go into making a very dynamic story, is that it's hard. It's hard to, because you have to make all of this stuff that we're talking about, especially if you're only writing one character story or through one story, you have to make it impactful and still also somehow cling to the structure of you know, how we're going to move through the story from a structural standpoint. This is why having this knowledge and really studying this, and it's why I don't watch movies to watch movies. And people don't like watching movies with me because I don't watch the movie. I break them down. So, you know, when I'm watching a Marvel movie, it's all about look at this thing they're doing right. Look at this thing they're doing wrong, you know, and all the stuff that we just did here. 
I'm doing live as I'm watching movies, talking and pausing the movie and rewinding it. I don't remember if I if if we did it offline or if we actually did it in a podcast, but there was I was watching My Name is Earl, which is my comfort food. I've watched that show, all four seasons of that show, I've watched at least six or seven times. And a friend of mine hasn't seen it. So we're actually watching it together. So it's like the seventh or eighth time that I've watched every episode. And yet we're in season one, like the third or fourth or fifth episode. And there was a line that one of the characters said, I was like, whoa, whoa, pause that, rewind that. And then I played his dialogue a couple of times and then I actually wrote it down. And I'm like, oh my goodness, look at this. Cause it, it was, it was something that I never would have gotten in the past. Cause it was, it had to do with the fact that I'm really into script writing now and movies and TV, even though I'm still writing a lot of prose, but it, because my mind is now on this new medium, it impacted me in a way that never would have impacted me before. But that's kind of how I watch TV now. That specific line, just for uh, those of you who are curious, is Randy said, are you going to tell her she's, are you going to tell her he's alive? She thinks he's dead, but he's not. He's not dead. He's living. He's alive. He's not dead, like she thinks he is. Which is a crazy line of dialogue in prose, but it really works. On TV. Yeah, you couldn't. You and I think we did it offline. Yeah, we did. But we did do it. You offline. could not do that in prose. Mm -hmm. It is so repetitive and so boring <clears throat> that anyone reading that is going to be frustrated by it. But when the actor delivers it, mm -hmm. it's freaking hilarious. And that's why, like, I had to rewind it and write it down because it's so ludicrous from a prose standpoint, but so on point from a script standpoint. And, you know, so now I'm studying the differences between the medium. So, you know, my mind is in a different spot. You know, just to wrap this up, that's the thing. It's, it's about really spending the time to learn this stuff so that because the reality is, is I don't think about this stuff when I'm writing. I have been studying this now for, you know, I've been writing for 40 years. I've been studying this stuff 25 to 30 years. I've been teaching it for 18 years. I know this stuff at a, at a pretty deep level because I've devoted my entire life to it. And so that's why I preach what I preach. It's why I practice what I preach, because I truly believe that this story creation is not just a way to make money. It's not just a, a, a thing to do. I think it has a much higher calling. I mean, and I've, I've said this before, it definitely is my religion. Um, if I'm religious about anything, I'm religious about storytelling. It is what I believe is the thing that I want to sacrifice myself for. It's my Steve Rogers quest to be the best that I possibly can and sacrifice myself on the altar of great, impactful stories that hopefully make better human beings as they go through these stories. But this is why it's so hard. And this is why there's so much to learn and so much to think about and so much to practice. And hopefully, you know, you coming along with us in this podcast is, is hopefully open your eyes up to that. So that, so that you join my religion and you take it very serious and you preach the, the gospel of storytelling and not just puke words on the page and, and hope you make a dollar. And hopefully even like what we talked about, like, like going through those six questions with the Captain Marvel movie. And hopefully you're like, holy crap, it would have been a, so much of a better movie if they had just done those six questions that I learned about on a cra crazy little podcast that I listened to for free. Like, I don't like, like these people are going to college for this stuff. So my final thoughts on character growth arcs is if you don't have a character growth arc, your readers won't be left fulfilled. No matter what happens in your story, they won't feel fulfilled. And if your character growth arc happens too fast, they won't feel fulfilled. So if you want to fulfill your readers backwards and forwards on your character until they make their major growth moment and reach their end goal. And I think that that is a good note to end this episode on. Yep. And we will see you soon. Till next time. Hi guys, this is Marie from Releasing Your Inner Dragon. And I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you're interested in more content on fantasy world building, head over to YouTube and look up Just In Time Worlds. I release tons of content there. If you'd like to check out my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, it is available as an ebook, audiobook, and print book on Amazon. Thanks for listening and see you soon.
Hey guys, Drake here. Thank you so much for listening to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast. I hope you're getting a ton of information and maybe even some nuggets of gold that you can take into your own writing to help you on your journey of story creation. A couple things I want to throw at you. First of all, for the first time in years, I am opening myself up to being a private mentor again. If you would like for me to work with you to improve your writing right now, reach out to me. You can either go to my website, maxwellalexanderdrake.com, and send me a contact form or or just email me at author at maxadrake.com. Also, as many of you may know, I've been out of the novel game for quite a few years. I was the lead fiction writer for EverQuest Next from Sony. I've been in the movie and TV industry for a few years now. But I am excited to say I'm back into the novel game. I've actually been working on a novel for a little while now, and I'm going to start dropping it on Amazon's Vela. So if you're on that platform, look me up, Maxwell Alexander Drake. Thank you again for listening, and as always, keep writing.